This week I'm working on a 3D topographical map of a canyon in Utah that I'm going to carve out using the HandyBot. Every summer I take a vacation to Utah and spend a lot of time hiking in the national parks there. And I'm always pretty fascinated by those really big 3D relief maps that they have in the visitor center. They kind of show you the layout of the park and where all the trails are and some of the major features. And I've really wanted to make one for myself for a long time of some of my favorite areas. So I found this pretty useful source of free elevation data for the state of Utah. And they have this nice interactive map where you can sort of fly around, locate the area that you want, and then highlight that location. And it will provide you with all of the available elevation data for that part of the state. I've always enjoyed looking at aerial views of the desert. Even as a kid, I used to watch movies that had helicopter shots of Utah and other places, and I used to just love thinking about how all those formations got there. And you really can see the patterns in it from the air. And so it kind of inspired a lifelong interest in geology, and it's been an image that's always stuck with me. This is the goosenecks of the San Juan, which is the area that I'm going to try to model today. And I've really liked this area a lot for a long time, uh, so much so that I've actually done some landscape paintings of the same area, trying to capture what, the way that the shadows uh, play on the rocks during sunset. So I'm just going to kind of navigate my way along the San Juan River here until I can see that familiar shape uh, that I'm that I'm going to model. And there it is right there. You can see the road that leads up to the park there and you can actually drive right up to the edge of the canyon and walk out and look down on that uh, really interesting flow pattern of the river. I see that the national elevation data set has a 10 meter map of the area which is pretty good detail and should create a pretty good model for me. So I'll download that model and open it up in this GIS program. The model is really just a table of numbers that assign an elevation to a coordinate. Uh, the GIS software will take this digital elevation model and convert it into a raster image, which is just a black and white image where the dark colors are representing low areas and the light colors are representing high areas. And I'm just going to tweak the min and max values so that I can capture the most range of elevations or the most detail in my model and so I want to make sure that the highest areas that I'm interested in are mapped to white and the lowest areas are mapped to black so that I don't lose out on any of that detail and so I find the parameters that work just about right for me and then I'll just save this out as an image file and then I will uh, load this image file into Aspire which is sort of the upgraded version of vCarve that allows you to create 3D models from bitmap files. So I've got a six by six chunk of urethane foam that I'm gonna carve this into. So I'm gonna go ahead and say that my work area is six by six, and then flip over to the modeling tab where I can import a component from a bitmap image. And uh, Aspire does this pretty much the same way that the elevation map was uh, doing it, where it assumes that you want to carve deep in the dark areas and carve less deep in the light areas. And so right there, I've already got my 3D model done. Um, I just need to tweak some of the parameters for how tall my model is and how thick the base is. So I can adjust these, and since I've kind of been to this area before, I can mainly judge what looks right. And so I will just tweak the shape height a little bit, and you can see there that it makes the differences between low and high more extreme. And so I'll kind of run this up and down a little bit until I find what looks right. And I can actually rotate the model around and put myself right down where I've stood before while looking down at this river and just sort of see if the view looks like what I remembered it as. So just tweaking a little bit more, and that looks just about right. And I've got a two inch thick piece of material, so I'm going to add a three quarter inch base uh, to it that will just give it some meat on the bottom so that you know, there's enough material to hold the whole thing together after I'm done carving it. So with that set up, then I'm just going to do what's called a 3D finishing pass. And here I'm choosing a gap above my model 
that will give me a little bit of clearance in case the top of my material is not entirely even. So here I'm going to be choosing a 1 16th inch diameter ball nose bit and that's a really small bit that will allow me to get a lot of detail out of the carving. And because I'm carving into something really soft like urethane foam, I'm going to be able to do it all in one pass. There will be no need for any roughing passes. But when I look at the simulation of the cut, everything looks a little bit uh, ribbed and low resolution. And so I'm going to go back and edit my toolpath and fix what's causing this problem, which is actually the step over, which is how much the bit moves over between each pass. I'm going to make that a lot smaller to get a lot finer detail. It's going to take a while to render the toolpath this time, but now as I preview it, I see that I get a much smoother surface that I'm happier with. So I'm going to go ahead and save this out and get my material set up and ready to go. So I don't really have a good way to hold this down. I could drive some screws through the urethane and just screw it into my MDF base here, but I don't really want to do that. Um, I'd rather just have the material be entirely cut through. So I had a couple of pieces of wood sitting around and a couple of uh, wedge blocks from my uh, set of building blocks that I had as a kid. And so I'll just sort of jam those in there uh, and clamp the piece of urethane foam between these two straight boards. And just throw a clamp on there to push those wedges in to keep the thing nice and tight. And um, with that all tight I can check and make sure it seems like everything's pretty stable and it's not going to move around while I'm cutting it out. So I've already put in my 1 16th inch ball nose bit and I'm just going to line it up with the front left corner of my material and zero it there and then drive it out to the center and just sort of step it down until it's roughly in line with the top of the material. And so here we go. Uh, I've got a clear dust fit on it this time just to give us a little bit better view of what's going on uh, during the cut. So the strategy that this tool uses, this toolpath uses to cut out something in 3D is called a raster, which means that it moves the tool back and forth and steps back by the amount of the step over that I chose. And then it kind of bobs up and down to follow the path of a 3D model. And so it kind of um, slowly relieves the material and reveals the 3D form. And you can see here why I chose this small ball nose bit because it's able to get down into the crevices where the river is running through the canyon. If I had chosen a larger bit, then it would not have been able to fit down into those small areas and I would have lost that detail of the, of the deep river channel. So uh, this material doesn't make a whole lot of noise when it's cutting and it really does just cut like butter and the dust collection is able to suck up all of that dust which helps keep my desk clean in my studio. So uh, looking at it here, everything looks pretty good, um, but I'd like to go ahead and uh, put some paint on it as well. So I just use regular acrylic paint and I don't really prime the material or anything. I just go ahead and throw the paint right on it because I figure I'm gonna be putting on a couple of layers to get the color that I want. So I just go ahead and start painting. Since I've been here before, I sort of have a memory of what the colors looked like in the landscape. And I'm going to start out with sort of a rust orange color to capture that oxide that is in the rocks around Utah. If you've ever been there, you know that the, the reddish orange color of the rocks is so striking. Uh, when you first cross the border into Utah, it's the first thing that you notice. This part of the country is really interesting. Um, there's been a lot of geologic activity there. And things like the goosenecks of the San Juan what we're painting now were created because of uplifts. So this part of the landscape was lifted up and there happened to be a river already running through it. So in order to continue running downhill, the river had to cut a really deep channel into the plateau. And we're left with uh, these really intricate incised meanders. What will eventually happen is that the river will wear its way through the really thin neck of the meander and will bypass one of the loops altogether. And what will be left in the loop is called an oxbow lake. It's kind of a body of water that used to be a river that gets cut off and just sort of remains off to the side of the river. So there's a lot of really uh, interesting geography in Utah that you start to understand once you study how all the geologic processes work to form it. 
Most of the rivers in Utah look very green. And there's even a river named the Green River. And it's pretty cool when you go to Canyonlands National Park, um, you can see the confluence of the Green and Colorado Rivers, which are both different shades of green. And where they mix, you actually see these uh, two shades uh, combining together and uh, the Green River uh, flowing underneath the Colorado River. So now I've got my very own 3D map of Utah that I can do my own aerial photography on, on miniature scale. It looks pretty real to me, so I'm pretty happy with it. Next week I'm going to build a wooden frame out of a really beautiful African hardwood to hold this model in. And I'm going to be cutting some kind of complicated uh, finger joints for the frame, so it'll be interesting to figure out how to do that. So be sure to tune in again next week uh, when I'll try to finish this project up. In the meantime, we have a couple of other videos if you're interested in other HandyBot projects, or you can check out the HandyBot store.